Uh, once again, my name is James Burke. Um, this project, Mars VR, has been a real personal journey for me. Um, this is, I guess, probably the first example of the Mars Society actually doing cutting edge research on our own to try to promote humans to Mars and speed those things up and do things that are really exciting that can excite the public in, in a lot of different ways. The, the goal of Mars VR, which I and others started five years ago, is twofold. It's number one, to tell the story of human beings walking on the surface of Mars to as many people as possible in an immersive way, in a visceral way, in a way that they can feel and touch. And the second goal of Mars VR is to tell the story of what we're doing with our analog research program in uh, the Utah desert, as well as our station up in the Arctic and flash, flash line Mars Arctic Research Station. So the Mars Society, there's a, you know, there's a large field of analog research. There's bases all around the world. There's programs all around the world. But the Mars Society, we built the first analog station in the year 2000 and the second one in the year 2002. The MDRS in, in Utah was the second one. We've had over 280 crews, over 1,500 individual crew members. Uh, Jessica Watkins, a NASA astronaut who just stayed on the International Space Station, uh, just returned to Earth. She went through our program at the MDRS in 2005. Um, Cyan Proctor also went through our program, was a crew commander at the MDRS. So we, we wanna to try to get the word out about what we do. And, and this is one of the different ways we can try to do that. And, and especially wanna get it out to the young people in the, around the world, because the young people are those that are going to settle Mars. And so the more we can connect with them early in life, and get them excited and inspired about human beings walking on the surface of Mars, then that helps us, it helps our partners, it helps folks like Rocket Lab and Relativity Space and SpaceX. So we started this journey five years ago. We did a Kickstarter campaign. We raised $31,000 and we built the first version of Mars VR by scanning a square kilometer of terrain in the Utah desert and all of our buildings inside and out with in 2018, the latest VR techniques. Now, those that have, have advanced significantly in the last couple of years, um, and we, it was a successful prototype, but we knew we wanted to do more. So um, I actually met Jeff, at uh, Jeff Rayner, uh, whose company is Mixed Reality, based in Seattle, and they've developed over 100 VR applications um, for clients like Boeing, Microsoft, and many others. Um, and so Jeff and I have been collaborating together and together we did another crowdfunding campaign last year. And this time our goal was $100,000. And I was like, there's no way we're gonna get $100,000, Jeff. Like you're crazy, um, but we did it. And uh, we actually raised 109. And so Jeff and his excellent team at Mixed Reality have been hard at work on Mars VR. And so today we're going to show you the, our latest uh, progress. Uh, and it's something I'm very proud of and something that the Mars Society, um, we can hold up as an example of us doing cutting edge research. So with that, I'll give it over to Jeff. Uh, All right. So, Jimmy. So that was what James was just referring to. Um, I like to put it slightly different way. We don't do VR. We make digital dreams, right? We we take the real world, which let's face it, reality sucks. How many people here, for example, have been able to go to MDRS? Two, two, right? Three. How many people wanted to go to MDRS? you know this is one of the problems we have there's a much bigger audience than people are able to go so james's dream is to flip that on its head and say let's give everybody the chance if we can't go there in real world let's go there at least virtually and so over the last year and a half we've developed a series of programs that while vr is the kind of apex of the whole thing 
we've delivered a whole array of solutions. So everybody on every device, wherever you live, has the chance to experience some of these things. And 200 or so backers actually were a good piece of that pie. And now they're in that pie, which we'll show you in a bit. So the key objectives were many, right? We've boiled it down to these few, but as you'll see, as we go through it, we kind of expanded it into a list of 25 maybe. But the, the core was, can we rebuild the MDRS? And this is often called a digital twin, where you take a real world place and you make a virtual version of it. James wanted to say, I use James, but the large extent of James, James and everybody associated with this, how can we give this experience to everyone? And how can we give them that experience irrespective of the devices they have? So if you have an iPad or a phone, but not a VR headset, we still wanna give you some, some part of that experience. The other part that has frustrated James in the past is the fact that you can bring people to the MDRS, but then they spend the first few days doing the basic training, not doing the research and the really good stuff that they're there for. So if we could accelerate that, learning process by having to do it virtually, then they have much more intense and better program model there. So today we're going to talk about three different areas. The MDRS 360, which I've not even mentioned because it wasn't part of the original objectives. The MDRS VR, which is a, a variant of the name, and Mars XR. You'll hear us talk about Mars VR, which is James' big term vision. And that is essentially the overarching umbrella of all of these areas. So let's talk about MDRS 360. And what that really means is a 360 view into the MDRS, not just a 360 experience, which is one of the components we offer. But as James said, in 2018, they, they took some Matterport images and they built a, a basic tour. And we realized nobody was able to really see that tour. Nobody was using that tour. What could we do? to leverage that to help build our virtual version, but at the same time, make a version that was applicable to everybody. So we added, we took the, the guts of the, of the images, the 360 image in this case, and we put it into a WebXR format that can be served up to everybody on any device. Not only that, we take you on a tour. So very similar to the, the real virtual reality version, you can go around and you can have this amazing voice it might be james it might not be uh, giving you his personal opinion about like what are these buildings for what what are their significance how does it make a difference to you then you can actually go around and irrespective of your situation whether you're in a, a wheelchair whether you are in africa it, it doesn't matter you can have an experience here and what's even more is at any point you can have somebody else join you in that experience so you can have two people going around this tour. You can have one person, you have James, for example, giving you a personal tour, even though he's remote. So it's a perfect virtual learning tool. In addition, we've got a ton of Easter eggs and a ton of fun things, fun facts and stuff to find, which is also mirrored in our real experience. One thing you may not have realized is just earlier on, we actually brought in a, a rover that we were test driving. Did anybody see that? No, uh, so it's taken for right from the back of the room there. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> In reality, this is augmented reality. And I don't know who knows what that means, but a core element of James's idea was that all of the components that we put into this virtual reality solution could and should be available to everybody who wants to use them in anything else that's related to Mars exploration, space exploration, et cetera. So during the process, not only did we rebuild all of the habs and the buildings and all the equipment, and we tried out different variants of the vehicles and things, but we then exposed those to everyone. And so what we've actually done is create a series of 360 experiences, 3D models, and AR experiences too, that can be shared with everyone. And you can go to marsvr.com and, and check those out. But And so this is one example, which is the, the rover that we were, one of the rovers that we were testing uh, which is a, a, it's actually taken the, the carts that you have at the MDRS and making them kind of a bit more futuristic and fun. Uh, but you'll see these as hidden in the experience too. And you can scan that as one of the things and put it into your room anywhere you are. 
Uh, this is a great thing for educational things, uh, tools for kids, for example, but actually fun for everyone. So then we go on to the core of, of Mars VR, right, which is the MDRS VR is our internal project name for it, just because it separates it out. We started a year and a half ago-ish, right in the middle of COVID. And um, we started with about a square kilometer or so, and it was fun. But we soon realized we wanted to do more and we wanted to expand more. And we were talking about, could we do experiments and we do research and EVAs and things like that. And of course, if you're doing an EVA, you want to have a decent area to at least explore. So we expanded it and we more than doubled the area, almost quadrupled the area. So that took us to about um, like four square kilometers or so. But then as we were looking more, we found out how oh, we could go even more and more and more. Uh, and so the current experience is about three square miles, all in virtual reality, all in very low lag and good frame rate so that everybody can experience it, even if you're on a basic VR machine. We also made a version that works through Steam without VR as well. So even if you don't have a VR headset, you can have some of the experience. I'm just going to very quickly go through. This is like a, a few video screenshots of it. What we actually did is play, play on James's words a little bit and his ideals. One of the things he said is he, we want to make this analog of the analog almost, right? And so we call this the, the duologue, right? In the fact that we take the analog experience and we add to it. And what do we mean by that? It means when we hear about the science, such as ingenuity. Oh, you might, can I cut the sound on that? Can I do the circuit background? Is there a sound button somewhere? Okay. I'll... <laughs> so I don't know if you can see any of that. Whenever we hear new science that comes out in the real world, we actually add those elements in here. So I don't know if you saw that coral that they found on Mars. As soon as we heard that, we added corals, hidden elements, Easter eggs, as we call them. So if you stumble across that little thing, it looks like a bit of flower. It's actually just like the minerals. And they're not fully sure what it is, right? But uh, we add that in. Uh, there's the doorway right here, our version of the, the little doorway that they found. Uh, you saw ingenuity flying. So you can actually find ingenuity and you can see it doing its its special maneuvers. We mimicked exactly what was in the real world. Jake, jump in any time. Yeah, and it's having ingenuity, I don't know if my mic's on, having ingenuity and things like that just brings in more people that are interested in the current missions to what we're doing. Because they, you know, they can see a real model that's functional, that has real physics in our environment. Um, and by the way, uh, he showed the train on an earlier slide. We've been, we've both been told that this is the largest VR application in terms of the amount of stuff you can explore that's out there. Yeah, we've gotten that feedback from a lot of people. Can you charge? I'm sorry? Can you charge people to do it? No, this is a free download. Is free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Mars Society back has ended up paying for this. So I'll jump to the next one. Another thing that we came across as we were doing it, James and I were on a call with uh, space.com or something. And the first person who came up with a question was, can I bring my dog into this experience? <laughs> right? And at first that was, that was kind of amusing. And then more we thought about it, it's like, that is a really legitimate question. And, um, and that's one of those things we haven't solved for yet, but absolutely could in the future as a, an add-on is actually having pets and seeing how personal how you change and how, depending on how long you live in this, which is another one of James's concepts for longer term, is to say what kind of science experience can we do in virtual reality that we might want to do at the base of a can't. We can potentially have lots of people living in virtual sims and living similar worlds and seeing, okay, how do people react with certain situations? Do people who have a virtual pet react in similar ways as a real pet, et cetera? Um, it turns out that we put an Easter egg in here, which I'll show you in a moment. In fact, I'll just press space to play this. And um, we added Martian gravity into the experience. Again, back to this duologue where we've mixed up the real world with the virtual world. And so here you can pick up these cans. The blue cans actually have the gravity of Earth and the red cans have the gravity of Mars. Again, it's a great little science experiment where you can try throwing stuff. And it's, it's kind of really eye-opening just how life is gonna be so different on Mars. And I don't know if you saw it earlier with that ball, even playing ball 
in well the ball came later because the wall street journal actually heard about this and they called us up and they said hey are you going to be able to play sports in this game and we're like well that wasn't what it was designed for but we can actually try and play around with it and so we actually did put a few sports elements in there too and you very quickly learn how sports are going to be even if you could run around in a really lightweight suit you wouldn't really be able to replay that this here you wouldn't really be able to play things like soccer or basketball or if you did you're gonna to have to completely change it because a little knock is essentially going to take it three times higher and three times further so there's sorry yeah there's there's definitely some options to consider right the long and short of it is you know you year and a half later, we have now met all of those initial objectives of MBRS. And so we're looking at, okay, what are our next level objectives? Where else do we want to go? What else can we do? And that brings us on to, oh, well, actually, as we go there, I wanted to say thank you to everybody here. This is just a very quick overview of, we like to put these Easter eggs in and to our experiences. Sometimes they're scientific. Other times, like in this case, they're actually just thank yous. Right, anyone who contributes to the Mars VR experience has their name listed in there. And not just in one place, actually in multiple places, we have Easter eggs of Easter eggs. So here, for example, is the credits at the beginning. But then we show you, if you go into the, the hab itself uh, and into the airlock, there actually is a new plaque with everybody who's helped in the creation of this listed in there. So now we go to what we call Mars XR, which is the extended version of, you know, we've now built the duologue. <laughs> what's, what's version three going to be like? Where do we want to go? And this is where it starts to get exciting. As James said, we've got this to this level now that we can start to explore the additional capabilities. One of the ones that we've read through on all of the comments that anyone who posts comments on, on Steam about this game for free, um, we read those comments and we say, can we incorporate that now? Is it something we should put on the, for the future? And one other thing that we've also gotten requirements from uh, is the Mars Society leadership, Robert Zuberin and others, um, you know, are giving us guidance of what we should do next. And one of the things that we really wanna uh, attempt to do, which is Jeff's about to talk about more is a field science uh, demo. So we can actually have people that are out in the field at MDRS in analog suits represented in VR and have the VR participant, the VR person using it, uh, seen by the analog astronaut at the same time. So they could actually explore a real place, uh, a landing site, or do some field geology together. Um, and that I would represent a breakthrough in field science uh, if you're able to get that kind of high fidelity assistance as an analog astronaut you know that would be good for you but that's this also would be great to have in a museum or a school where you could walk up and help ex help a real person explore a real place on earth and that's preparing for the long-term vision of when there are astronauts on mars and they are able to bring along rovers and drones to scan their landing site that could be put into a vr environment back on earth and mil literally millions of people could help them explore the landing site along with them, you know, vote on things that they could, they should go explore. Um, and, and we call that idea crowd exploring. You know, NASA is really big on crowdsourcing. Um, you know, we funded this project through crowdfunding. So we call, call that concept crowd exploring is having millions of people assisting an, an astronaut to explore Mars. And taking that one step further is building out different experiences based off of the prototypes that we made. It wasn't like we just knew exactly how this experience was going to be and nailed it right out the gate, right? We tried lots of different variations to ensure that everybody could enjoy it on all these devices. And some of those experiences we, we shelved and others we, we pushed and we built additional prototypes on. So one of the ones is what we call sim experiences. So for example, um, you can see here, this is a full motion simulator. So we took in a load of NASA data. And, and if, in fact, if I go back to those other slides a moment ago, I don't know if you recall, we actually took the terrain of the Utah desert, but we made a 
a dual version, as it were, with it. Well, it's got the terrain and topography of the Utah desert. It looks a little bit more like some of the places on Mars, which give us a bit more exploration. And we, you know, there'll be parts that look very much like Utah, and there'll be parts that look very much on Mars. So you get this duality, this ability to what you do here is essentially going to be there. And to James's point, in the future, one of the concepts is we expand the space even further. As we get more NASA data, just like we have here for our flight sim, uh, where you can actually fly around uh, uh, parts, different parts of Mars in different ingenuity versions. There's some slow, some fast. Uh, you could, we'll actually be able to swap in any high level terrain that we get into the extended terrain of our experience here. So that again, to James's point about crowd exploring, you could have multiple people actually walking around a virtual version of Mars. Uh, the other part, if anyone does play the game, uh, I'll say the game, the gamified training scenario, right, uh, is that they'll, you'll find there is a, a rover there. And um, in the in the future, one of the things we're exploring is being able to actually drive that rover because everybody wants to drive the rover. <laughs> uh, the, the other part... Or fly the helicopter. Or fly the helicopter, yeah. yes. And you, in fact, you can do both if you haven't had that full motion sim. But uh, we were going to bring it. It's a little bit heavy to bring here. But if you ever come to Seattle, you can look us up and try it out. Uh, James, you want to talk about the remote comms too? Uh, yeah, the remote. Oh, yeah. That's basically um, uh, part of exploring a landing site together is having a real-time chat, you know, real-time voice link with uh, the astronaut and the VR participant. And so to actually pull that off where we actually have someone out in the field far away from the hab in Utah, um, it requires some technical you know, technology to do that. So radio, uh, ham radio type technology, which we're working to develop, but also to send data across um, so that you can see the position of the person uh, in the VR application in real time. And vice versa, you can have uh, out in the field, you can see the VR participant, their ghost, we call it, in real time. And why this is relevant, in the middle of Arizona here, you actually have better cell phone coverage than in Seattle, bizarrely enough, despite being in T-Mobile's hotspot. Uh, but obviously in the middle of the Utah desert, there is no cell coverage. So what can we do to expand those comms and actually make it really relevant and bring the same tech that we use in here into the real world. So it's not just real world going into virtual, it's virtual going to real world. So here is a little image essentially of what it's gonna be like in the future where we'll be able to have a holographic viewpoint of all of the different areas of the MDRS and the, the people on different missions. And you'll virtually be able to see them moving around and understand, are they in danger? Are they finding stuff? What are they finding? So bringing back not only their positional data, but any imagery and additional inputs that they want to send back to us. The other area is, um, as we've gone through this, is actually figuring out things where what's really cool about Mars and incorporating that into what we're doing here. Uh, some of the things actually that have evolved are what we're going to do with the base, right? The, the MDRS hab itself uh, has for, for a long time been, been repaired, but there's the chance of looking at that and going, we were building this now 30 years later, would there be any differences? Alfredo at the back there, he's gonna be talking later about some additional possibilities from his architectural standpoint to say, oh, if we were to do this again right now, this is how it would look. So definitely look at his presentation too. But in addition, we have these, these other experiences that are based off of this. And one of them actually, as we get these new pictures from, uh, from Perseverance and things, like, can we incorporate that into this experience? So this right here is an example of our version of the Mars VR when it goes sunset versus the one of NASA. And amazingly, it looks incredibly the same. So that being said, uh, if there's any time, we'll open it to questions. But apart from that, we will, we will see you on Mars. <laughs> Thank you very much. First off, great presentation. Um, as you said, you know, when we just, when you guys, when we discover new things, you guys add it to the game, how long does that usually take? You know, I'm sure it depends, but on average rough timers. 
We have some very passionate developers on Jeff's team, and it seems like it's as soon as we have a great idea, it's in the game. It seems like or it's in the application. So yeah, and that, to your point, there's some things like if we have a science fact, if it's really poignant, we will try and get it out within three days, let's say. Um, if it's if it's a like the the driving component, we would love to put that in immediately. There's a lot of complexity to driving in VR without making people sick. <laughs> and so that requires a bit more and that'll be hopefully a later one, but anything from a few days to a few weeks, typically. If you're familiar with agile methodologies, that's what we try to do. Super, super interesting uh, and great presentation. It's evident how this becomes part of, call it the, uh, um, our society infrastructure, you know, um, and of course I'm an IT guy. I know James, you're an IT guy as well. You know, the, sometimes the hardest part of, of the systems are making them live to versions 1.1 1 .1 and two and on and on and on. What are, wh what's the thinking in terms of life cycle management of this and uh, the architecture between Mars VR and all of its different applications and the MDRS hab and other things. I mean, there's um there's a whole effort that has nothing to do with technology but all about making all these different things talk together and live together for a long time as i mentioned at the beginning this is a long-term program of, of work for the mars society and so um one of the things we decided at the outset was we're going to try to bring in as many um volunteers and open and try to open source and share the uh the work with as many people as possible. So for example, a lot of the prototype models we made back in 2018 of the HAB and the campus, uh, we put those all on a site called Sketchfab. And so other creators can download those and use them in their projects. And Jeff and his team have done a lot of different uh, 3D models of our rover and other things at the campus. And, and those are also available to share. And so, um, Tying, tying this work together with the MDRS and our larger body of analog research program is, is, is also something that we, from the beginning, have been trying to do. Um, you know, we consulted with Dr. Shannon Rupert on the terrain, making sure that it was realistic, um, consulted with her on what crew training we should have, like what is, I asked her straight up, what is the stuff you're tired of training people on that you have to do over and over again every crew every two weeks we have a field season that runs nine or ten months out of the year and so we have a crew every two weeks and there's stuff that she has to teach all the crews well let's put that in the vr app so that they can train on that at home and then when they get out to the mdrs they can just hit the ground running because they know where everything is and what to do and so we want to support and enhance all the other work that's going on um, yeah, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, you might ask, well, do I have to have a, you know, $3,000 VR headset to use this? Um, that would that would be nice, but we actually made the 360 environment that could work on any web browser, on any smartphone. Um, it's, it's completely um, portable. And so, uh, you know, we wanted to make that available to as wide of an audience as possible. And, and the immersive environment, the MDRS VR, the one that you can actually manipulate objects. We've also, you know, to your point of the life cycle of things, you know, with virtual reality technologies evolving so quickly, especially in the last five years, um, we have had to rebuild things to take advantage of new capabilities of the underlying libraries and infrastructure available to us. And so we've prioritized doing that. You know, there, are, there have been times where we've had to do a little bit of rework. But the end result was a much more robust code base that then had more advanced features. And we could add in things like the immersive peripherals that Jeff showed, the, the, the Yaw VR. Uh, we actually, we try to make this work with as many VR peripherals as possible, up to and including things like smell, hardware, and haptic gloves, haptic shoes, haptic vests. So we want to make um, this available or, or compatible with as much technology out there as possible, so. Looks like we have about two more questions. Do we have enough time for that? Yeah. Yeah, we can take uh, two more. Thank you, Go good presentation. Do you keep track of use, use of uh, your product and uh, 
first, um, how many people not just download, but actually actively using it, plus uh, specific components of that. Uh, perhaps you can also analyze if it's uh, less used and maybe there's a usability issue and uh, uh, then you can uh, add a priority in uh, developing that particular component. So yeah, absolutely. I, my background is actually in, in data analytics. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I have to take my finger off that button of looking at it uh, as often. Right now, uh, you know, we're about to do another push of the experience as well as incorporate all of the, the training materials. I think that's going to be extremely useful when it comes to learning from Shannon Rupert. The people who do turn up, did they actually understand what they were supposed to before they get there and look in the, the efficacy of it? So 100% behind understanding that data and seeing if we can, if we need to adjust to get even better results. We do have this on the Steam platform. There's a lot of analytics we get for free by doing that, downloads and views and things like that. And long term, having a really deep analytics layer embedded within the application is going to be really good for research purposes. And so that's definitely a long term priority for us. The, the other element to that is it's not a game. Because of it, if it's not a game, people don't play it as much, right? So some of the things we try to do to entice people in is hide these Easter eggs, update it regularly with the science facts as they come out. And we even have about a dozen achievements in there. If you can figure out what they are, uh, we have a lot of interactable objects. So we actually have two music designers that you on your um, on your hand pad, as it were, you can actually change the music. You can look at a map. Um, there's a, it tells you how far through each mission that you are, uh, as well as all about all of the achievements. So if you look up high, for example, there's a like a you can see these little Easter eggs. Oh, I've got what is that? And you have to climb up in order to get it. You have to solve puzzles essentially to do it. So we've not, not launched that and told the world, but the, this, we're hoping it's kind of builds its own community, and we can also track all of those achievement logs as well. Great, great presentation, great work. Very excited to be on your 2021 plaque. That's a neat thing. Thanks. A lot of fun. Um, how open source are you? For example, it makes me sad thinking, you know, at some point ISS is going to die. Uh, and then Skylab's no longer here. Is there an opportunity to like go to your community and say, hey guys, could you go build out ISS, go build out Skylab and have more achievements, have, have more more story there or is that just completely off mission and james says no way you Mars know, so there's a guy in the audience peter. yeah where is he is peter here i sort of come in he's on he's on in a little bit he might have just been prepping for that so there's a guy here one of the problems we do have right is we are technology bound so when we built those extended ex levels or terrains it wasn't only just because we wanted to it was because the technology evolved even during the 18 months that enabled us to do that we want to keep doing that but the more that we do that the harder it eventually does become to make it open source right and similarly there is a lot of individual code and models that we we got loaned to us that we can't give to everyone so unfortunately we can't make the whole thing completely open source however there's something called neosphere and that is essentially one of the key players of this thing that you're hearing about the metaverse right which is a more open source platform where anyone can come in and actually build on that world. And Peter, who will be chatting later about the spacesuit, he lives in that literally every single night. He's in there and he's built some of the things for James. He's built some of the stuff for me just purely because he wants to open this stuff out. So we make these models. He takes those models and incorporates them into a, a virtual Mars. And while it can't yet do everything that we do here, soon it will be able to, right? And so we're trying to build this in parallel and we're trying to feed him all that info and help him as well. He's not completely on his own, but together, you know, this will be the Mars metaverse. Great. One last thank question you so over much, here. Everyone. I, no, I think we're out of time. Actually, we're running 10 minutes over. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James and Jeff. For our next uh, guest speaker is uh, Ashley Kowalski from Sirius 21. Welcome to the stage.
I just It's a pretty, pretty big file, so <laughs> bear with me here. There we go. All right. So hello, everybody. My name is Ashley Kowalski, uh, and I was a crew member for Sirius 21, specifically the flight engineer. And Sirius 21 was an eight-month astronaut analog mission held in Moscow, Russia. Uh, and we were uh, living and working in there with a crew of five, a multinational crew. We had participants from Russia, the US, and the United Arab Emirates. So let me move on here to the next slide. So Sirius stands for Scientific International Research in a Unique Terrestrial Station. It is a joint effort between Russia's Institute of Biomedical Problems, INBP, uh, located in the heart of Moscow, and NASA Johnson Space Flight Center's Human Research Program down in Houston. Uh, so uh, the purpose of the study, of course, is to understand, better understand the effects of isolation and confinement uh, on the human body, whether that is psychological effects, physiological, immunological, emotional, mental, you name it, we're trying to study it. And so the serious missions are, uh, the one that I did, Series 21, was a series of, of several missions that were already completed. So in 2017, there was a 17-day mission. In 2019, there was a four day, oh, sorry, a four month mission. Uh, one of the participants of that is actually at, over there in the audience, Anastasia. Um, and then of course, last year we did the eight month study, which we just completed in July, July 3rd, 2022. Uh, beyond this, there will be a 12 month study and uh, with the potential of multiple follow on year long studies after that. Uh, we conducted during our present or during our mission about 70 different experiments, and uh, those experiments were submitted to us from countries all over the world. We had experiments we were running, uh, of course, from Russia and U.S. and the Emirates, as we had participants from there, but also Germany, France, Italy, Canada, uh, the Czech Republic, Japan, and other countries as well. So really a multinational international uh, effort. So just a quick meet the crew. Uh, so as you can see, I am wearing the official Series 21 flight suit that we had during our eight months. Uh, Oleg Blinov uh, is a former cosmonaut select. Uh, he was our crew com crew commander. Uh, I was the flight engineer, Victoria Kirchenko. She was our uh, crew surgeon. And then we had two mission specialists, William Brown from the US and Sally Al-Amri from uh, the United Arab Emirates. And down here in this photo down here, I didn't want to uh, 
uh, shortchange our backup crews. So prior to the mission start, uh, we had two months of training in Moscow. Uh, and each one of the prime crew members had a backup member as well. And so they played a large part in our preparation. And of course, uh, they were ready to step in at any moment. Um, and a good example of that is that our Emirati crewmate, Saleh, uh, was actually the backup crew member initially. Um, and at the last minute, we had a switching crew member. So he was ready um, two days before the mission started. Um, he jumped in and uh, really, uh, really impressed us. So the facility that we were in, it's uh, the NEC facility, NEK, uh, because that stands for, in Russian, Nazirne Experimentalny Komplex, so it's a ground-based uh, space simulation. And the facility is a completely hermetically sealed facility where they can control the temperature, the humidity, the pressure, the CO2 parameters. Um, it has its own uh, water supply system, sewage system. Uh, and all of that is controlled by the engineers and mission control on the outside. Um, but on the inside, we can also monitor those factors. So if we saw something that looked abnormal, uh, we would be able to contact mission control uh, and help uh, understand what we can do to fix the situation or alert them to the issue. Uh, so you might also, so this is actually a quite a historic facility. Again, it's in the heart of Moscow at the Institute of Biomedical Problems. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Mars 500 study. Um, the Mars 500 study was where a crew of six uh, stayed in this exact same facility for 520 days. Um, so let's move on here. All right, so I apologize for the super speed of this. If I had extra time, oops, let me turn the, let's see if I can turn the, the, um, is there a way I can um, turn the volume off of that? Um, I thought I had it off, but well, maybe not. <laughs> um, but well, it's, sorry, I'll take a pause really fast. Is there is there a way I can do that? Because um, I really would like to show you guys at least a sped up version of the tour of the facility. Uh, if I had more time, I would just play the entire 15 minute segment, but I Sped it up four times, um, so annoy, uh, you know, disregard the fact that it looks a little bit silly with the high speed, but um, I, I think it really gives you a good idea for the layout of what we were living in for eight months. Um, and oh no, no, that's okay. Um, let's see, can I get out of the presentation view and mute it? Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll skip through that then. Um, so. Uh, we did a, a lot of different psychological studies. Um, that was the um, main component of the experiments that we were doing. And um, so, you know, we had a lot of surveys, a lot of questionnaires that we were doing throughout the time uh, to evaluate our crew dynamics, our emotional and mental health, our um, just general well being. And a lot of times those surveys were paired with blood samples and saliva samples that were taken in order to uh, compare our answers to our uh, cortisol levels, things like that. Um, so <laughs> there were so many surveys. I, they were pretty much the bane of my existence in, 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 in isolation, but they were um, helpful to our researchers, of course. Um, we had perception of time studies. Um, we did weekly EEGs on ourselves. Um, that every other week were paired with different cognitive tests. So over here in the picture over here, I have um, myself, what, it's a picture of me preparing an EEG on myself. So we had electrodes on our body. And then um, once the uh, signal was verified on the EEG, um, we the system measured our um, uh, state, uh, our brain activity state when we have our eyes open versus closed. And then afterwards we would do a cognitive test. Mm -hmm. I think I can. Oh, do, sure. Do you want to go back? Yeah, sure. Um, we would do a cognitive test, um, that, um, basically on the bottom of the, uh, presentation we have, I, nope. <laughs> I tried. Okay. 
All right. So the door behind me is where we entered the facility. Um, and I'm standing right now in module 250. Uh, so module 250 was the module where we had all of our storage, all of our equipment, all of our food, all of our hygiene needs and sanitary needs. Um, and over here, I'm showing you some of our food tube samples. So this was basically how a lot of our food looked like. We had um, sublimated food here, which is basically dried food that you would add water into and make it into a food. We also had some ready to eat foods in there. Over there, we had some pickled beets, a Russian specialty, some uh, uh, canned goulash. Um, everything was coated together um, by number and shelf location. So we knew what was exactly on that shelf. We could use a scan code to know what we have there. Over here, I'm showing you the NASA glove box, which is what we would use uh, to analyze the lunar samples from our simulated lunar missions. That computer is where we would look up any inventory that we wanted to make sure we had enough food left for the rest of the mission, for example. 3D printer that I just showed you. We're entering the workout room. That's a NASA weight training machine. Over here is our greenhouse um, where we grew enough that we could make a nice fresh salad shared among five of us uh, about once every two weeks. Over here is our active treadmill and passive treadmill. Um, this is our shower area. We were able to take a shower once a week. Um, that was one of our bathrooms. This hallway is where it connects module 250 to 150. But what I'm showing you right now is the lock that basically we sent out any of our blood samples or urine samples or saliva samples in addition to our trash or dirty clothes. Um, to, and we did that to maintain isolation and not see the outside world. Currently I'm in a kitchen, which is in module 100. Um, you know, we decorated it pretty nicely, but this is where we would gather three times a day to eat food. I'm showing you our weekly schedule here. Everything was scheduled for us to the 10 minute mark pretty much. Uh, so we knew what we were doing when, what experiments we were running when. Down this hallway is our rooms, our individual rooms. We could decorate them as we want. I'm showing you how big they are. Basically width wise, it was about this big, um, but there was uh, complete privacy in there, no cameras. This is our daily planning conference room. Um, that is, as the flight engineer, that is where I was making sure to check all of our module parameters. That lock is what connected us to our lunar module, module 50. It was only opened up when we were doing extravehicular activities. Um, that's another bathroom for us. <laughs> um, walking back down this hallway, we'll hit our leisure room. So we did have opportunities to relax, watch a movie. We could also do work in there. Um, and then as I crawl through this, uh, this, this lock over here, we enter into module 100, another bathroom. And this is where the majority of our experiments were. That's a bone density experiment. That's a rover simulation. That's a docking simulation, virtual reality docking simulator. Uh, continuing on uh, lunar rover simulator. We've got our EEG device there. Um, another EEG device and FNIR's cap. Um, and I... Uh, an eye medical device. We have the cardiac machine right there. And it looks like we're glitching, but that is basically it at that point. Um, I'm not sure why that happened, but that's okay because it was basically done. Um, and the only other thing at the end of this that I wanted to show you is that um, we were under constant video surveillance at all times, no audio. So they couldn't hear what we were talking about, but they could always see what we were doing. Um, so there was nowhere to really hide except for your own individual bedrooms. And of course the bathrooms did not also have clearly um, uh, cameras in them. So um, I mentioned daily planning conferences. So I wanted to um, point out on this side, the two, um, the two on your left. Um, so every morning and evening, we would talk with mission control about how we're doing. Did we have any problems? Do we have any questions? Um, and just, you know, just checking in with them. And while that was part of our operational uh, task, it was also a psychological study um, because we had a, a high fidelity audio device in front of us. And also, of course, they were recording all of our video messages. So they had software that could analyze our voice and our facial expressions to see, um, to kind of uh, analyze our uh, emotional and mental and psychological health. Uh, the next one on the other side, the four photos over there, um, that was a study of mitigation of mental stress. So if you'll well, notice on the computer screen, it says yellow, but it's shown in blue. And on the bottom, you um, have different colored blocks and there is a name of a color in them. So the researcher, in order to create a stressful situation for us, he created this program 
where, you know, if we saw yellow in blue, um, we would see the word yellow. And of course, we'd maybe be confused because we're seeing, in seeing it in blue, but that means that we need to choose blue because it's the actual color, not what's written there. It's, uh, it's a lot of words, then, but um, basically uh, during that ex experiment, we would take a saliva sample in the beginning, then do an EEG, and then do 10 minutes of that stressful assignment, take another saliva sample, change into an F nears cap, and then after that, um, do 10 minutes again of that stressful scenario, and then another saliva sample so that the researcher can analyze, um, again, your cortisol levels and your stress rates during those times. Um, let's see. Next. So for teleoperations, um, this was a study submitted by some by French researchers. And basically, this was to study and evaluate the impact of isolation and confinement on an operator's teleoperation performance. Um, and we did this by running a software program and, and performing a software program um, where we were building a lunar base and collecting lunar samples. So we would put electrodes on us so that they could track our cardiac measures. And um, we also had a visual tracker in front of us to see um, our um, ocular motor uh, activity as well. And so I created a little video here. So this is once I put the electrodes on my body, those were peaks showing my cardiac activity. This is what the um, simulation looked like. This is a video of the eye tracker. That's me. Um, <laughs> and then you can see we are also picking up lunar samples. And we did this, uh, I believe it was once a week or once every two weeks. And uh, the researchers are trying to understand um, you know, did our did our performance main, stay the same? Did uh, did it improve? Did it degrade over isolate or over the eight months of isolation? And this specific study is also going to be uh, done with actual astronauts and cosmonauts on the ISS. And next here, oops. Uh, we also used virtual reality um, for sensory stimulation. So this study was done to assess the feasibility of a very uh, immersive virtual reality environment uh, and see if that gave us a, a positive effect and uh, helped our mental well-being uh, during our isolation and confinement. And so this is <laughs> uh, what we saw in those uh, virtual reality uh, glasses. So you usually started with a nice fire pit. It takes you into something that looks like almost Sequoia National Park. Um, you're the, you have prompts in your ear asking you, how are you feeling? Like all this stuff, well, what's changed since last time? And you can talk out loud. It's, you have your private moment. Then you go into space, you have a fully immersive experience. And then you have a survey at the end that says, well, how do you feel in this moment? Um, and in addition to these, these types of factors, there was also blood samples and saliva samples, again, uh, collected throughout, um, throughout this, uh, particular study. Uh, so also to check our course cortisol levels. And next here, we also use virtual reality for docking simulations. Uh, and so in this particular study, the researchers are hoping to understand how uh, our piloting skills um, degraded, or again, maybe stayed the same, maybe improved, uh, basically the quality of our piloting skills uh, during a long-term isolation and confinement mission. Uh, and so um, this was a German study uh, submitted to us. This was the panel that we saw. And I will go to the next slide because I did another video here. Let's see. So this is me on the um, virtual reality. Uh, looks like I did not. We'll just let Will talk. <laughs> So, 
So let me just go back a slide really fast here because um, so every month we had to do one of these docking simulations and every during that uh, session, we had three specific dockings to do. One was using only uh, only visual uh, um, uh, parameters. The second time was using only instrumental parameters. And the third was a slightly more complicated situation where you use a combination of uh, visual and instrumental. Um, and so it was checking also our uh, hand movements, our eye movements, again, in order to understand uh, pilot uh, piloting skills and whether or not they degraded. Um, so let's move on next. Okay, so, so at this point, I'm moving on to some of the physiological studies. I'll do a time check here. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so for physiological studies, um, so gastroenterography, this had this was a multi-component uh, study where um, sometimes we wore electrodes for 24 hours in order to understand the electrical activity of our gastrointestinal tract. Um, we had ultrasound uh, for our organs. We did Yuri's breath tests to understand the bacteria in our stomachs, bicarbonate breath tests, um, carbon, carbohydrate breath tests. Um, that was for our glucose metabolism and function of our pancreas. Is a multi-pronged thing. And so some of the tools that we had up there um, uh, were what we used for our sampling. We had respiratory um, uh, respiratory studies as well, assessing the state of our respiratory parameters and of our respiratory uh, muscles, the strength of our muscles. Did they degrade in isolation? Next, uh, we had some studies that uh, analyzed the whole body energy consumption and energy content. Uh, we use laser Doppler flowmetry to assess the changes in our microcirculatory bed. So basically, uh, it was a small laser that um, once it touches the skin, so basically we did it on our foreheads and on our uh, non-dominant hand. And basically, once that laser hits your skin, um, uh, the light undergoes a change in wavelength. It's like the Doppler, it's a, it's a Doppler shift, essentially, uh, when it hits those moving blood cells. And so the laser, the LDF, the laser Doppler flowmetry, it... Um, uh, analyzes the velocity of the of the of the blood cells uh, in order to see the changes in your microvascular system. All right. So acid base balance. Um, so for this one, uh, this was essentially an assessment of the gas composition of the blood and the acid ba base state at rest and during a physical activity. So. Um, that involved usually taking a drop or more than a drop of blood, a small little um, sample of blood from your finger. So we did that at rest, usually right when we woke up before we had any food, and then also during a physical activity. So over here, we're on a bike. Um, once you're, uh, I think we went up to like the 85% of our max rate. Um, and uh, then another crew member, in this case, Oleg Blinov, our crew commander, would come over, take a sample of our blood, and then see. Um, uh, and then and uh, see how the gas composition of our blood changed, our capillary blood. Um, next here. All right, so over here we have PRBS, pseudo-random pseudo -random binary sequence and cognition tests. Uh, so this was a test that combined physical test with cognition. Uh, and so basically uh, while we're running, we had uh, a VO2 mask on us. We, um, before and after isolation, we also did FNIRs on our caps. And then we also had a flanker test in front of us. So as I'm running, um, I can turn this on here. As I'm running, you'll notice I have two clickers in my right and left hand. Uh, and so based on what that center arrow, which way that center arrow is facing, I need to click right or left. So this is particularly important for, let's say something like an extravehicular activity where you are doing strenuous physical activity for multiple hours, but you need to maintain your cognitive abilities. So researchers are trying to uh, duplicate that kind of an environment in a laboratory setting and as closely as possible and, uh, and also um, see how, our, how isolation and confinement uh, affected us uh, throughout those eight months. And next, oops. We also had sleep deprivation studies uh, where we had sleep fragmentation, sleep restriction, and sleep full sleep deprivation. Fragmentation meant that we had to wake up every hour of the night for the entire night and then perform some uh, some tasks. 
Um, we also had uh, restricted sleep, about like five hours of sleep, and then have to get up and do some tasks, and then full 38 hours of sleep deprivation to see the effects on our autonomic nervous system, and then also how we recovered afterwards. Uh, so we would sleep in these really attractive devices on us. <laughs> um, and, oh, and also, let me go back really fast. During that time, we also collected blood samples, saliva samples. We did echocardiography uh, uh, measurements. We did blood pressure measurements. And the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to map out biomarkers that um, could say if a person is more reliable in those types of uh, sleep deprivation environments, or if they're more, more vulnerable to um, not performing well. And hopefully they'll use these types of biomarkers to select crews that'll be um, more ready for those kind of uh, situations for long future long duration uh, human spaceflight missions. Um, and I'm really running out of time, so I'm gonna speed through here. We did a couple of uh, extravehicular activities, three in total that included um, virtual reality tasks, body unloading system, and a lunar rover when your arms are also unloaded. So it feels like you're on a lunar surface. So I think the best way to talk about this, oh, here's a couple of pictures of our crew, um, but I will skip over to the video as that's more exciting. Um, so this is um, the mission control room uh, as they are uh, watching over our EVA. The virtual reality environment is what we see through our virtual reality goggles. Um, over there, I am in the body unloading system that is simulating the lunar environment. These are the two crew members during that particular EVA that stayed behind in the orbital module while the rest of the three of us went out into the lunar module. Um, here is Victoria and I are donning our virtual reality goggles in our lunar, um, uh, lunar suits. This is our view, first person view. And this is Will, he's back in the lunar module doing communications with us, telling us you know, what we need to do, when, letting us know how to fix any problems we encounter. This is a close up of me on the uh, body unloading system. So again, uh, we're on a, we're lifted up so that it feels like you're on the lunar surface, but we also have a frictionless or a, sorry, a reduced friction uh, surface. Um, this is me on the arms unloading system where we're doing the uh, lunar rover um, activities as well. And then, uh, Fun, fun last couple of slides. Um, so we have uh, oops, different examples of food. Of course, I showed you in the video tour that we had sublimated food in packets and tube food. The tube food was kind of like we would have Texas burger or Sicilian pizza or <laughs> chicken and mashed potatoes coming out of a tube. Um, and it's basically this puree paste type of consistency. Think like pate or something like that um, coming out. Um, some sublimated soups. So it honestly, like, I mean, looking back at it, it looks pretty good, right? <laughs> Um, so we ate well over here. We have a fresh salad on the bottom center that is from our greenhouse. Um, and then next slide here. Oops. Speaking of our greenhouse, we did manage to grow some tomatoes. We had green onions, uh, different wheats, different lettuce. Uh, and then we also had to do physical activity. So for running, we ran three days on, one day off, three days on, one day off, usually in a stochastic type of run where you go from high speeds to low speeds, high speeds to low speeds. We also had two different weight training machines. Um, we had the NASA weight training machine in the center. The Russian developed weight training machine is over here on the left. And of course, like when we're training, we're not wearing the masks like we do during the tests, but I wanted to show you that that is what our passive treadmill looked like. So we had two options. So the passive treadmill, of course, is, is one where you're motoring it only with your legs. Um, we did have a couple of operational tasks, uh, lunar sample assessment in the glove box, computer and device ma maintenance and repair, uh, lunar landing site identification, uh, acoustic monitoring, light monitoring, 3D printing, and then space robotics, which was a fun one that is a um, Russian uh, study. And I do apologize for the volume again. I um, thought I turned those off. But basically, um, this device is a very human-like exoskeleton that really mimics all the mov movements of the human body down to the individual finger movements. And it's used for distance operations. So for example, if you're on Earth or on the ISS and you want to do lunar samples, pick up lunar samples or do a small construction, um, that is what we would use. And we're testing right here the use of virtual reality as a training device for that. Got it. 
<laughs> almost done here. Crew samples, um, oops. Crew samples, um, like I said throughout the study, throughout the presentation, we were giving pretty much every type of sample you could imagine, blood samples, urine samples, hair samples, um, poop samples, <laughs> um, um, saliva samples, you name it, we probably gave it to researchers. So um, that was that was really fun. <laughs> and then just a final uh, uh, slide for us. I'm really proud of us. We did it. We managed it. And one last slide. I will be doing another analog coming up at the end of November. Um, I am uh, an employee with the Aerospace Corporation. So this is a company sponsored um, uh, uh, mission. Um, so we're crew number 269. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out for our crew. And with that, I don't think, I don't know if I have time for questions, but maybe one question or two questions. Or, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, congratulations. Awesome. Oh, that's that's pretty interesting. So from your pers um, subjective perspective, were there any um, cognitive senses or capabilities that you think were affected the most during that time? You know, it's from my from my subjective point of view, I actually felt that my abilities were almost improving during that time. Um, like my docking skills for the VR docking simulation, I felt like I was only getting better and better throughout the, throughout the simulation. Um, because, you know, I was, I, I knew what I did wrong last time and I knew what the situation would be next time. So I knew what I wanted to improve. And so I felt like I was constantly improving actually, but, um, we'll see what, uh, the researchers actually say with the final analysis. They have a couple of years to analyze the, the data. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we were completely isolated. That's very possible. I mean, we were not, you know, we we did have access to, you know, news coming to us and stuff, but it wasn't a, a typical, you know, social life or or work life or things that were distracting you. It's, um, yeah, I I think that definitely definitely helped. I don't know if there's yet. <laughs> hey. Uh on the other side how would you design them to be more effective i don't i feel like the questions were very very generic i think researchers could actually get more out of surveys that gave us more ability to you know write comments in there for example you know some of the some of the surveys asked us you know how did you feel in this certain module during this type doing this type of experiment um and i could say like oh it made me feel happy or it made me feel like you know whatever the options were but I, what was hard for me to understand is they don't understand why I feel happy in that situation. And so I really wish that I had more opportunity to write my personal comments. And I think that would help researchers, honestly, because some days the module might make me feel upset um, because, you know, it, it's giving me flashbacks to an experiment that I don't like doing. Or maybe one day I'm like, oh, I did really good on that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking this now. Like, I, I like being in there. <laughs> Right. Uh, Steli Ford, Moon Dow. So you said you're with the Aerospace Corporation. What was the name of the company? Yeah, the, Air the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, yeah, so that's very interesting to me. So did they send you, did they sponsor your trip to Sirius? Are they just doing the Mars Society? No, sponsoring? so I, I took a complete leave of absence from mm -hmm. aerospace to do this because this was a NASA sponsored project. Mm -hmm. um, so I was technically under NASA Johnson Space Fed Center for this for this year. Um, but now I'm back at aerospace and the Mars Desert Research Station mission that we're doing is completely sponsored by our aerospace corporation. So what is the value to them for you going to MDRS and were they in any way involved with supporting you towards Sirius in terms of that leave of absence? Um, I mean, I would say the support for Sirius was more, um, you know, they were, they know that this is something that'll help me with career goals, goals and things like that. And so that was, that was really the support there, but they didn't have any studies or anything that we were doing for Sirius. However, for MDRS, um, so for long duration space missions for the eight month one, for example, that's more about psychological health, honestly, more than anything. And the two week MDRS missions, you can't really see changes like that in just two weeks. So our goal for aerospace is really to test out more the operational nature of some equipment that we're developing um, to see, okay, like, is this, um, you know, from a human factors perspective, like, does this equipment, you know, work on an actual EVA or, or um, you know, uh, did, the, did the plan for the mission work out in such and such way? So it's more an, it's looking more at the operational aspect of things rather than the psychological and, and physical change aspect. Very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>
apparently I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> all righty. And here we go. Okay, folks, our next talk is a panel about the MDRS uh, analog suits that uh, we use at the station. Now, this has been a labor of love by our, one of our chapters, the Northern California chapter, uh, for many years. Um, the effort's been led by Scott Davis. And uh, as, as Scott and Judd are bringing over some of our gear, um, I'll just tell you that uh, you know these these suits go through a lot of wear and tear every field season. Um, you know, crew members use them almost every day when they're in sim. They ride in the rovers with them. They explore all around the MDRS, and so as you can imagine, they get scuffed and scratched, and things on them break. But what Scott and the other volunteers at the NorCal chapter do every year is completely refurbish them. Um, they augment them. They Every year they're better. Every year they're more advanced. And so um, they do a fantastic job. So I'd like to welcome up to the stage Scott Davis and Judd Reed. Judd is um, someone that's been involved with the MDRS program for many years as well. Um, and, uh, and and then we're also going to invite up a third person, and that's Peter. Now, Peter is a, a mad scientist type. Um, we included him on this panel late uh, uh, just because um, the work that he has done on his own is just phenomenal. And while this is not officially yet part of the Mars Society, it's in the same spirit of what we do with our analog suits. And so... Uh, welcome to the stage as well, Peter. Uh, Peter also um, is going to be part of this panel, but then he also has a solo talk that we'll segue right into uh, when we're finished with our uh, initial remarks. So, um, so each of those microphones should be on. They're pushed to talk. You guys can feel free to have a seat or stand, whatever you want to do. Uh, yep. And then, um, so let me just kind of start with. Uh, our slide presentation here, and let me make sure the folks on Zoom can see this as well. I apologize, my video has been off all this time. Let's share the screen. And so, uh, Judd, I can kind of uh, advance the slides if you want to kind of narrate. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you just push, push, push the talk. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, oh, I better. Turn the page. So, yeah, go ahead and start. Yeah. Okay. Might have to add a little closer. Yep. Here's the first slide. So, so did you want me to kind of talk through some of these? Well, yeah, I'll keep talking through them. This deck is pretty brief. It's just sort of to set the stage for. Is it? You start it now. Try talking without the hand on the button. Check, check. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> your your push okay. to talk is reversed okay. for some reason. So I, I prepared this little deck um, just sort of to uh, give a framework to our to our discussion. Uh, it is certainly not a presentation, um, and for this to be successful, it's going to require. Uh, require more from you than from us. Um, but I wanted to kind of outline what we've been um, doing. Um, for, for for this deck, I've, I've got the brief history of, of sim suits at MDRS, um, and then a closer look at how air flows through them. And uh, finally, a, a, a suit that I've built to help us quantify um, the performance of the older ones. So here, this little table shows the uh, the history of sim suits at MDRS. Um, the first or the original set lasted for nearly a dozen years, um, and then after when those were at near end of life, I was trying to maintain them and couldn't, uh, so I built a few um, a few suits to, to fill in the gap until we had a new design and a stronger version. Um, those didn't last very long, and we got the uh, 
in about 2004, we, we re rebuilt based on the old design, uh, the suits that you're seeing sitting in front of you. Um, those are still in use and uh, I'm missing something. Oh, um, while those intern suits were being used, the uh, uh, I, I built the, a prototype of the suit that's sitting there with the, the single piece suit. Um, my motivation for that was to make it easier for me to, to maintain the other ones. Um, and, and then we started the reset where we had a, a new implementation of the original design, including the one piece suits. Um, and then for uh, many years, <laughs> Scott and team have been making you know, incremental improvements to that set of suits. Uh, and finally, um, I have the, the colorful one sitting there is one I built just for testing. Uh, and we have no idea what's coming next. Well, we have some ideas, but they're not ready yet. Excellent. So these are the original suits. Um, the photographs are actually from F Mars, where the suits are identical to the ones used at MDRS. Um, and these are the ones that lasted for uh, for a decade. Uh, the picture on the right shows the, the basic airflow through them. There's um, two computer fans inflating a, a dam in a, uh, a storage container and a couple of tubes flowing into the helmet um, with air vents coming up. So there's positive pressure on your head and then they, that leads to uh, venting around your neck and out the back. Uh, next. And from what I understand, these particular suits here are still at FMARS, from what I understand. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll be hopefully using them again next year. So, so then I mentioned that I built an interim suit. This is uh, functionally very similar to the ones we were looking at, uh, but the uh, the storage, the pressure chamber, the, the dam, which is really just a, a Tupperware box. Um, I shrunk it so that it was less vulnerable and put it in a, a wooden, or in some cases, a, a PVC framework. Um, also, you see that the dome is a single, um, a single piece. And that had the disadvantage that air could not get out through the top, but only through the bottom as shown in the graph on the right. Next. At about that time, or just after that, I built this the prototype suit for the, the prototype for the one piece suit. And uh, as you can see, it's a pretty crude single frame, has the same components as the, uh, the one I just got done showing. Um, and it is still in use. The, uh, that wooden frame was was uh, covered in canvas, and uh, occasionally we have to stop and tighten the canvas. But other than that, it's been running for for, for many years. Uh, and so those suits, the um, those suits were used for I think a few years, um, but were not built of the same quality as the ones we had either before or after. So we we uh, got some new funding and started over. Um, the NorCal chapter rebuilt um, based on that design, the ones just in front of us, they have a much stronger box, um, similar design helmet, but all of it sort of re-engineered um, and the same airflow as it had originally. Next. That seemed like just another view of the same. Yeah, it was yeah. another. Yeah. Um, we also redid the, the single piece suits. The, the view at the top can contrast the, the prototype on left and the, uh, the current uh, one piece suit on the right. The, the balance of these pictures show the uh, various stages of our construction. As you can see, it's a wooden cabinet with a, a metal um, hood over it. Try to talk right into the mic. Oh, sorry. I can't talk forward and look backwards. <laughs> um, since that original implementation, um, Scott and company have been working on incremental improvements every year because every year he gets new information about uh, what failed during the year. Um, he's re-engineered the, the collars, which are now 3D printed, um, swapped out the, the computer fans for uh, centrifugal pumps, uh, changed filter positioning, um, and a host of other small changes. Um, over the past, uh, well, uh, over the summer, I built the colorful suit on the, the far left, or lying on the ground on the far left. Uh, this is not a prototype of a future suit, but rather is a test, um, 
platform where I will be able to measure um, temperature and pressure and uh, humidity throughout the airflow to determine whether uh, a reconfiguration of how the air flows through the system uh, would help or not. That system is uh, is modular enough that I can configure it in many ways. And the slide, the graph there shows the most com complex method it, it, that I've tried. Um, starting at the bottom, air enters uh, with the brown arrows, passes through a, a, a centrifugal uh, dust separator, um, rises through uh, on the blue arrow through a heat exchanger. Um, with a pump at the bottom, and then again a pump at the top, you know, injecting it into the helmet. Then the whole process runs backwards, of course, um, pumping air out of the, the helmet through the heat exchanger again, where it will cool, um, and uh, and on out through the exit. The stars on that graph represent uh, the location of all the sensors. In each location, there's a temperature, pressure, and, and humidity sensor. I've also got a little four-button keypad, which, which is actually uh, a larger keypad that I've uh, masked down to just four buttons. Uh, and there's audio commands that, um, that give you feedback. So so it's a, it was an easy way to build the interface with neither a display nor a, um, a full-fledged uh, keyboard. The, the main concern, the reason I'm uh, interested in these measurements of pressure and temperature um, has to do with the flow mainly. Uh, and I wanted to stress that these are not very big pressure changes. So I've graphed um, our current location, MDRS, and then MDRS with a suit on, uh, so your pressure at your head. Uh, and just for fun, I threw in the, uh, the highest landmark nearby, which is Factory Butte. Um, so in effect, when, when you're at, M at at, F, at MDRS with a suit on, you are about as far below the ambient pressure there as you would be above the, uh, at the equivalent elevation of being uh, at the top of the butte. Uh, the, the right part of that shows why we care about this. Um, the origin of the arrows is, uh, um, is the air coming out, uh, after is your, your breath coming out. Um, and of course it cools quickly and, and the pressure drops um, along the blue arrows. And what matters is whether you're on the, uh, the high or the low side of that dew line to keep the uh, faceplate from fogging. Uh, I've described it as being reconfigurable. Um, these two graphs show that you can swap the, the heat exchanger out and have just four fans running through it with, uh, in a sense, the pressure reservoirs. And I can configure it for um, both both fans injecting air in parallel or serial, um, or uh, one injecting and one extracting air, so the pressure is pressure at your head is ambient, uh, and and various other configurations. That's the last slide. That's the last. Yeah, that that was the, the whole. Subject. Thank you, Judd. Um, so Scott, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience with the suits and anything you'd like to add. That sounds good. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, I'd like to kind of show off the suits and talk a little bit about the history of them. Uh, I believe it was uh, 2016 when our chapter was asked to uh, uh, develop the uh, new suits. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, like the first yep, going back. Yeah, I might have the date a little off on that. Um, anyway, so uh, with very rather limited budget and a uh, limited time frame we uh put together uh what we call our two piece suits uh uh and provide them for the upcoming uh season that year so the two piece suits have the helmet and the backpack separate uh and it's got a uh shoulder ring that can be separated from the helmet and the shoulder ring attaches to the frame of the backpack. And it, it loosely attaches so it comes down over, uh, over your head and then the helmet can be placed upon it and latched onto it. And then the helmet attaches, uh, the air tubes attach from the backpack to the helmet. And uh, that's different from the one piece design where the helmet and the backpack are all basically one piece. Um, 
So we have, uh, we, we developed six of these two piece designs the first season. And then uh, for the next season, we developed four of the one piece designs. Uh, these were based on uh, Judd's uh, prototype um, one piece suit design. And we made them a little bit larger and uh, kind of gave them a nice fabric cover. Okay. Um, both of these designs were pretty simple and made heavy use of existing hardware where we could find it to, to make it into uh, a simulation of spacesuit. And we were going with uh, trying to provide the experience of wearing a suit on Mars. We can't simulate everything on Mars, of course, you know, just like at the MDRS, they can't simulate radiation and air pressure and uh, light levels outside that you would have on Mars. But we are simulating the bulkiness, the difficulty of doing EVAs, the sense of being in an enclosed environment, limited field of vision, limited uh, ability to hear things around you, which uh, affects communication. And, uh, and the difficulty manipulating and interacting with things while you're wearing the suits. And through these experiences, the crew, the crews get an understanding of the challenges involved and learn to work together and, uh, and overcome and get used to these challenges and familiarize themselves with them. And we also wanted our suits to be able to, in emergency situations, uh, where they need to break simulation. If somebody is sick, if they pass out or, or anything like that, to be able to remove the suit quickly out in the field and to provide uh, uh, first aid medical uh, support for that crew member. Um, so we don't want anything in the suit to prevent that from happening. We want them to be able to pop the suit off very quickly in an emergency situation. So the suits are made out of for the most part, uh, simple, straightforward hardware parts. The clear domes are made of acrylic, and we there's a company we work with that provides these. They generally make them for uh, like security camera domes, uh, and they're also used in uh, RVs and, and boats and other th places where uh, clear domes might be uh, needed for a particular design. Um, and the backs of these two-piece helmets are made from trash can lids, common rotatable uh, trash can lids. <laughs> nice. And uh, they have worked quite well. Um, they have worked quite well for 20 years. Yes. Wow. So another part of this design for these suits is not only are we trying to simulate uh, the suits, uh, the, the weight and the, the bulkiness and the difficulty of uh, suits on Mars, but um, also they have to be very uh, robust because they're, they're dealing with a lot of wear and tear and they have to be simple enough that crews can learn to operate them pretty quickly because these are crews that generally they'll have two week uh, crew, uh, crew times. Uh, and we often have like 12 crews for uh, a given crew cycle uh, each year. And uh, so there's a lot of different people wearing them, and uh, the crew engineers have to be able to troubleshoot them, repair them, diagnose the problems. Uh, and some engineers on some crews are more experienced than others and are better at, at handling these things. So we also provide technical support for the suits over email to try to keep it in simulation. And uh, so We've made, we started with things fairly simple and we've made kind of gradual improvements uh, to the suits of the seasons. Uh, we originally had for the shoulder and neck rings, uh, we originally had uh, these big PVC pipe uh, couplers that we had cut into the pieces, but they were extremely heavy. They're about as twice as heavy as these. And we've later replaced them with 3D printed um, shoulder and neck rings. Uh, hopefully th these ones are freshly printed, so I hope they will last this upcoming season nicely. We'll see. Um, and for the one piece suit, uh, it is largely made out of uh, aluminum sheets. Uh, um, let's see, uh, plywood, uh, aluminum angle brackets, uh, a lot of it is riveted together. And uh, both the, 
the designs use very simple electrical circuit with um, PC fans, originally PC fans on the two piece. We've later changed them to kind of squirrel cage blower fans that produce a higher pressure output. And we've added kind of a fan uh, speed adjuster on it. So crew members can actually uh, modify the this fan speed out in the field. And uh, the, the uh, one piece suit still uses PC fans, although we've uh, changed it to a high, higher speed, quieter fan uh, since the, from the original ones. And I believe the original prototype uh, suit that uh, Judge, the Judd uh, developed that's still being used at, at the MDRS uh, uses the original type of fans. That's right. It's identical um, electronically and, and um, well, it's identical in almost every way to the corresponding uh, two-piece one. Uh, all of the suits use the same type of uh, lead acid batteries, uh, 12 volts, very simple and inexpensive, and they are rechargeable. Um, we always have extra batteries there. Uh, we were looking this season into maybe changing over to uh, um, lithium uh, power tool type batteries, but we just did not have the time to make the changeover on it. It would involve a little bit of a changing out the electronics. So we are still sticking with 12 volts for now. The nice thing about them is they are very robust. They are not prone to catching fire or anything. And they, uh, well, it's very important for uh, for a suit. You do not want battery fumes or, or smoke or anything coming through the air system. Um, and we, um, they can handle the temperature ranges at the uh, high Utah desert uh, that the MDRS is at pretty well. Um, we think the lithium uh, power tool batteries will also handle these fairly well too, but we just not made the changeover just yet. The test one, uh, the test suit that I've got uh, does in fact have a pair of the lithium batteries. And, and so we will get some experience with that soon. So uh, the NorCal chapter is currently working on the design of a next generation SIM suit that we hope to be a little more advanced and custom built rather than reusing common hardware quite as much. Uh, we do plan on it on using lithium batteries for that. And we want to have uh, a small form factor computer on board with different um, sensors and readouts that uh, the crews can interact with. Um, by the way, our suits are just the backpacks and the helmets. And in the case of the one piece, they're all in one piece. But uh, the crews, each of the crews will have their own coveralls and they generally have a crew color that they have along with their crew patches. And they also have their own boots and gloves. I think originally the MDRS, they had, they supplied the coveralls for the teams, but it, they got filthy and they, they never had the right sizes for all the team members and it, it was problematic. So they generally made the decision that they uh, bring their own coveralls. So a lot of the suit, the crew is bringing with them and we supply the backpack, the helmet, the airflow system. Uh, they also at the MDRS have uh, radio headsets that they can uh, communicate with each other and back with, uh, with command at the HAB. Um, is there anything I failed to cover? I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot brought up in questions. Anything besides 20 years of experience? Yeah. Well, every, every year we, we, uh, we find out problems with the suits for the cruise season and try to make kind of incremental improvements. Uh, the two piece suits, we've had a perennial problem of, uh, the helmets fogging up, um, because, the airflow, uh, not only do you have to deal with airflow coming in, but in these suits, the air doesn't have a lot of ways to escape. So we added in the back here, we added a couple of passive vents with uh, little foam filters on them and the, to allow the air a little more area to, uh, to uh, passively push out of the helmet. And this last season, the only time we had a fogging problem was when someone's uh, battery died and uh, they effectively in simulation died <laughs> on their EVA. But, um, but they did not have problems with fogging uh, as far as uh, the reports went uh, when the batteries were nominal. So um, 
Yeah, so we've, we've done a lot of little things to improve the suits and I'm hoping we'll keep improving it, but eventually, hopefully we will be able to present our next generation suit design and get funding for it and eventually replace these and maybe they'll be used at some other location. So as an analog astronaut myself, I, I first went out to MVRS in 2018. And when I was wearing one of these suits and walked through the airlock for the first time in sim and went out into Mars, all over to Utah, I, I really felt like I was walking on Mars with a, with a spacesuit on. I mean, the, the experience was amazing. And so you know, hats off to you guys for all the work you've done the last 20 years because this is really, for the people that have the opportunity to come out to one of our stations, um, you're giving them an experience that is almost identical to what it would be like to be on Mars. And so it's fantastic. Um, so Peter, we haven't heard from you yet. So Peter, as, a, as an independent spacesuit designer, um, what, is your, what are your impressions of, of the work that these guys have done? Because I believe you're seeing some of this for the first time. Is that correct? Oh, I've, I've been haunting the site for years. You know me. Actually, I, I've done three very costs in the past. Halo costumes, that kind of stuff. But actually seeing pair parts of this size is, is amazing. I love it, honestly. It's, this is where you start. And, where you, and the thing is, it's functional. It gives you all the motions you have to have. Helmet on, the, all the procedures are the same. So, yeah, it's brilliant. Awesome. So at this point, um, I think we can take some questions from the audience. So um, the microphone's coming. Why don't we go right here? Guys, I'm so proud of you. Almost every day I get reports on what's going on with the suits and I'm dazzled. Two quick questions. Number sure. one, have you ever considered two-way radios where you can, you know, the, the astronauts and SIM could communicate with two-way radios? They certainly always do have the radios, but we don't uh, treat them as part of the of the backpack of the suit. Uh, they are provided, uh, they are managed separately. Uh, and this year we're having a, a very significant upgrade of our radios. Um, oh. oh, yes. Really? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna buy them all like eight <laughs> years hand helps to FRS. I've got a bunch of that now. <laughs> and the second part of the question, something original came to mind. Would the two ray radio systems we use here on Earth work on Mars? Uh, I would think so. Uh, Judd, do you have a? I mean, I can, I can understand. I'm, I'm, I'm a hammer operator too. They will only work for line of sight. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, and Mars has a closer horizon because it's a um, smaller radius. Uh, so they won't work as well as we're used to. There's no ionosphere. Um, so there, there are many reasons why the radios will not work quite as well. But yes, yeah, certainly they'll be, they'll work. Thank you very much. Did I get that yeah, basically, I don't think I don't think I don't think we, 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 we do HF on Mars. Clearly, there's no ionosphere to balance across. But for line of sight DHF stuff, two meters before that kind of stuff, easy. I don't see the difference at all in the slightest. So you had mentioned the data you're capturing for this year's suits and being able to improve them. Can you talk a little bit about what that data looks like, how you pull it down? Is it real time? And what you're gonna how you're gonna use that to improve the suits moving forward? Um, I want to make uh, before I answer your question, I want to make a, a clarification that the the colorful suit is not this year's suit. There's only one of them that will ever be made. And it won't be uh, won't be used routinely, so so we we have not yet upgraded the suits to to this um, to that style. Um, there are uh, there's a, a Raspberry Pi that is recording uh, the controlling the fan speeds and recording um, pressure, temperature, and humidity um, at ten different locations within the suit. No, at nine different locations within within the box. The, uh, the those are recorded um, at one minute intervals because running it faster than that would, would be useless. Um, and I, I don't know how long the because I've got the new batteries that we've not tested. I don't know how long that period would be, but there's plenty of memory on the Pi to record it. Um, and I will analyze it um, in comparison to the, the settings on the on the suit. Uh, while using it, I can can change the settings. Um, through, through the audio interface, um, and then that is also recorded in the same data stream. And I'm just dumping into a very large CSV file 
uh, and importing it into to a spreadsheet in a, uh, a MySQL database after I'm done. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I had a couple. Um, does this, uh, uh, the information you're generating, is this useful information as a database for eventual suit manufacturers? Um, part two, are there any suit manufacturers hypothetically coming to you? And number three, is there, any, <laughs> is there anything that you have wanted to model that you haven't been able to because you haven't been able to produce uh, a part or what is there anything you haven't been able to model that you want to be able to for the the history of the suits but for, for the history of, of mdrs uh, we have never had quantitative data we have lots of subjective feedback about uh, this particular design doesn't work or does work um, and, and scott's done a great job of reacting to that feedback but we've never uh, we've never tried to measure pressures or temperatures um, so, so we really don't have any knowledge of quantitative specifications for any future suit. Now that we're working toward moving to, to a new set of suits, um, hopefully we can do that with quantitative specs. And then that's the whole idea of the, the metal one piece suit is that it will give us that baseline. In the back there. Um, thanks for taking my question. I am. Um... I was listening to how you said that you created uh, the helmets from trash can lids. And you said that's worked great for 20 years. And, and I think it's brilliant that somebody thought that a trash can lid could be an integral, in, integrable, in, integrate, that's what I'm trying to say, integral part um, of the analog astronaut experience. But you know, if is it right to assume that you patented that design? <laughs> and, and if you did patent it, I mean, is, is like the trash can lid part of the prior art on your patent? I'm sure the, the company that makes the trash can Rubber lid made. has a patent on it. Um, Rubber the, the, uh, the original uh, suits of the MDRS and FMARS, uh, the helmets on those also had trash can yeah, lids. They were exactly the same. So, well, it wasn't the exact okay, same okay. trash can lids. To, they were a little bit smaller. In fact, the very reason these helmets are so large is we couldn't find a smaller trash can lid. Yeah. <laughs> and that was our limiting factor. It's kind of sad, but uh, so actually uh, for the next generation, see, we want to make the helmets a little bit smaller. These are uh, kind of bulky for what they need to be. But, um, but yeah, the, this was a kind of a case of making do with what parts would work well for this uh, design. And, and we were very time limited when we originally came up with these. So we were kind of trying to take the earlier design and try to improve it where we could, but, uh, but not just redesign it from scratch. So we replaced the Tupperware containers in the backpacks that was holding the the air pressure chambers and replaced it with um, a, a Pelican case, which is much more robust, a bit heavier too, but it's uh, much more robust and can handle wear and tear and impacts, you know, from accidents and such without much problems. So um, we, we tried to make use of the existing ones and a lot of that, or, or the existing designs and large, a lot of that was we were under quite a time crunch. So um, we did the best we could. Um, the uh, backpack frames on all of these, I believe, are uh, military style uh, backpack frames that we oh, just the got. Ones? Uh, they're Molly 2. Okay. Um, so they're not currently used by the military. I think they're a bit out of date but uh, they are er ergonomically designed for like the same one, heavy uh, backpacks. <laughs> Use the same yeah, one. Yeah, Alice from Goodwill. Well, <laughs> they, right? They're yeah. relatively inexpensive and yeah, easy to obtain. They're box. very robust and, uh, and they are ergonomically designed for the military. One of the fun aspects of, of trying to keep this uh, as cheap as we can and using off the shelf parts is that we outlive the parts. The, when we first started using the, the storage bins, of course, they were uh, perfect. Um, and when we first started using the trash can lids, they, they worked perfectly. But now the trash can lid is hard to find. So so the advantage of using the cheap off-the-shelf part diminishes. Um, and all of this design happened before 3D printing was widely available. So moving forward, of course, we won't be quite as reliant on 
uh, creatively reusing existing things. I think we have time for one more question and then we're gonna to transition to Peter. Okay. Uh, go ahead there. Hi, uh, this is not an engineering issue, but a spacesuit issue. I don't know if you guys have run into this, but um, you know, those of us interested in exploring space are happy to have a spacesuit. But a lot of times when I talk to regular people on the street about this, colonizing Mars, and they hear, well, well you've got to wear a suit outside, <laughs> forget about it. But it occurred to me not long ago that our, our bodies have a space suit, our skin and our lung apparatus. Our cells are all happily floating in a saline solution that they evolved in millions of billions of years ago. Uh, so I've never heard this, this before, but I wonder how many people realize, they, they think of this earth environment as the Garden of Eden, the optimal environment. This would kill us within minutes if we didn't have this suit that we wear every day. So I just wondered if you'd ever heard that and if that would be uh, helpful down the road somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, uh, that's very interesting to think about. Uh, our, our bodies are designed, we have evolved for billions of years into this environment and our bodies uh, are uh, not perfectly designed, but handle it pretty well <laughs> for the most part. I, I would hate to be out in, uh, in uh, Death Valley on a hot day, but uh, for most of Earth, uh, it handles pretty well. But um, we are not evolved for the environment of Mars. Uh, there are so many things there that uh, will kill us if we're exposed uh, for probably a very short period of time. Temperatures alone, uh, the uh, radiation over a longer time, the, uh, the atmospheric pressure, you know, so uh, there's a there's a, a lot of factors, and uh, yeah, the uh, the suits we design are are kind of the best we can do in a reasonable budget and technology level to simulate the suits that they would wear on Mars. But they're probably not you know uh, perfectly accurate the the weight or the uh, um, the sizes and shapes of everything. But we're hoping to simulate it the best we can. Um, but what I think people don't realize, and I know, didn't realize, despite being interested in space my whole life and being a physician, is that our bodies really haven't evolved that much. Inside this skin and outside of our lungs, <laughs> we're just basically saltwater creatures that are wearing a suit and a breathing apparatus. And so I think if more people maybe understood that, they they kind of understand this isn't so far from what we do every day. All right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I agree. Absolutely. Good point. Okay, awesome. So we're now going to transition okay. to Peter's talk. Peter, I think the first thing, and thank you guys so much for the work you've done. So Peter, I think the first thing we got to do for you is kind of, you're going to model your suit here. So oh, I'm going to... Should we bring our things out of the way? Well, or... Inflation and PowerPoint or vice versa? I'll take Which this one on the table. No choice. Inflation. Deal. <laughs> so Peter is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Peter is a mad scientist type. He's an independent inventor. Um, he's actually been a contributor to our virtual reality project as well. He's a VR expert. He, I remember him giving me a tour of Neos VR uh, in real time, and he has a full scale model of the ISS that I got motion sick in in VR. Um, but, uh, so what he's wearing there is a suit that he invented himself. And I know. I know. He, my own design, but I'll that man. Here's the chair here. So he's going to inflate the suit. Okay, well, um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, you know, Peter is one of those people that, uh, you know, he's working all the time. He's uh, got a million ideas in his brain and there's not enough time in the day for him to implement them all. But, uh, you know, I think it's a great compliment um, uh, to the discussion we just had about the MDRS suits because, um, as you can see with the work that Scott and Judd were talking about, we are, we are trying to push the envelope here. We are trying to make it so that our, um, our Mars simulations at our analog facilities 
are as realistic as possible, but at the same time as cutting edge as possible. And that we're using, you know, yeah, I'm not really aware of anyone else that's doing this type of work. You know, there's very few people out there that have the ability or uh, desire to do this. And so we're really blessed to have the NorCal chapter helping out. And uh, here comes Peter again, shoot over to him. So Peter, what are you doing right now? Audio link, you can't hear me in a helmet, so I gotta create one. <laughs> Come on, there we go. Where does he have Ikea? Who knows about Chris Motors are? There you go. Okay, that has tremendous work, I think. It's not bad at all the side, it's not bad for it. Please add on my kid. So, okay. Let's grab these two gloves. That's on. That's on. Not my whole bottle, please. So look, 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 look at this little suit here. It's basically based on design of Karen Smith, who packed Space Flight many years ago. I worked with him on a high suit and his name is first time as Trevor. And this is a result of all that research. Hopefully, those of you on Zoom are getting a good view of this. What are you well, doing right now, Peter? Put, put on the wrist rings. So these can handle up 800 PSI according to the manufacturer. Lot so far, in the last six months, I have spent over a day in this thing in testing. Mm -hmm. And the difference between his suit and the MDRS analog suits is that we do not pressurize the flight suit component. So we're just wearing the helmet and backpack over some regular coveralls or flight suit. Whereas what Peter has going on here is more realistic as to what a real astronaut would wear. And so what he's about to do is you know, he's basically hermetically sealing his gloves on so that no air can escape. Can I there, please? I'm sorry. Can I pinch my pinch over here, please? Sure. That's it, just right here. Oh, cool. I was just helping him. I was just helping him uh, turn, uh, put the pin in his uh, wrist collar. I don't think it is. <laughs> hey, Judd, he needs help. Can you help him? Yeah. Nice. Right in the middle and turn to the green. And it's pretty normal oh, in our sims for when you don or doff a suit to have a buddy. So this is pretty realistic, actually. Yeah. Usually, yeah. in, in, in yeah. sports, yeah, it takes an hour or more. So he just did that in about five minutes.
There you are. So basically, what this works is a uh, inside of here is an undersuit that has canvas that has independent material. The material is intended to pull from pole to pole. It's not fit for either two PSI. Fantastic. So I'm going to just give you the podium. That work. I promise to unhook myself this whole thing and on the water cooler. That's way better. <laughs> All right. So let me just share your slides for the Zoom audience there. And then you can just talk with this one here. Okay, dressing for the consumer space race. Well, we see how Elon Musk has managed to really cut the cost down for uh, rocketry, right? Almost 10 to 1 ratio in some points of time. Well, let's do the same thing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so the past is not cheap. According to what I'm reading, two are grand in, in old money to even prosper $20 million in some occasions for a space suit. But why? Well, Alice Dover made the suits, and Hamilton and Sunstrand made the backpacks for the Apollo era stuff. And so back in 2018, I met Dr. Smith, who is an anthropologist from PSU in Oregon, and he builds low cost space suits. He's been on the Wire magazine, has done two TED Talks on it, and taught me how to build the suits. And I spent about two years with their team helping them out. I designed a scrubber that was based on, I had as a concept I had based on the design of the original Apollo scrubbers. And that one was 3D printed and tested out in a Cessna, three hours on its auction cylinder. And it worked as designed from day one. We were gonna build a metal version, we ran out of money. So that was the end of that entire team and process at that point in time. So, build my own suit. This is the coolest thing the world ever cosplay as. I do cosplay and also engineering technician. I do aerospace work. And so for me, it's like, what's the ultimate combination of cosplay and actual engineering? Actual spacesuit. And Savage has, has some, right? But as far as I'm aware, none of them actually seal and have a scrubber or whatnot. Mine does. So the goal was kind of, kind of less, less than 10 grand. So let's cut the hose or the cord. Cameron suits or IVA suits, kind of like the ACs or Sokol, the, the um, ones you find for like the Russians and the Soyuz capsules or things like the old total program. Mine, on the IVA suits, is an EVA suit. And the backpack is right there. And that's actually the most important part. So, how it's made. The hide is. Why the hide is? Well, because honestly, it's cheaper than buying from, from uh, Joanne's. And also, on Mars, you can be seen. I mean, obviously, an orange based suit would look horrible on Mars. This still easy to find, right? You match your environment. That's the most, 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 important, most important part, basically. And so, the actual suit part you see in front of you was in a grand in total cost to manufacture everything on this, on this part of the suit. The air layer, or PGA, is, as I mentioned before, Ham is bonded to a polycode nylon. This stuff is just heat bonded at the end of the day. He's got a clothes iron from the 60s. And I use some, some glue to help seal the seal from the seams. And the joints you see, those little like black fellows things, aren't actually bonded to this suit. They don't hold any air. It's simply a guide, the internal bladder. This way you're not actually going to have all these joints, have all these little seams. It's just a bladder and then a constraint, constraining device, so to say. And so far on my shoulders alone. 
Thanks. Hey, drop the mic moment, you know. <laughs> Thank you for that. But the range of motion I, I get, I have, I don't have much rotation this way, but for actual range of motion, just fine. So here is the business end. It's a scrubber, similar to what we're trying to find for like a scuba diving system. But here is where all the fun, all the fun begins. Behind door number one. Nope. Tired, sorry. This is $2,000 of R&D. The top part is is scrubber. Air goes in on the big hoses out, just like this. But I have two plugs here and some sort of suit. Same kind of concept. And all the side here is soda lime. And two computer fans, actually actual fans, you find my server, a 20 volt drill battery, and a buck module you find for like, you know, power supply stuff. Simple. Next, please. Yep. Uh, I should have more. Yeah. Oh, that, is that, is that all you have? Should be. No, there's six more. Right okay, cool. So, first light. Two weeks ago, this happened. I finally got the, the, the actual IO ports installed, put on the backpack, and for about an hour, ran around the outside of my house. No CO2 problems. No real issues with thermal problems once the energy was on full cooling mode. And I could walk around in what amounts to a fully functional spacesuit. Now, a little fact right here the A7 LCs used by NASA were tested at 10 psi and they burst that pressure. Mine held 10 psi over ambient. So that's wicked from the first try. I think that was the slide you were trying to talk Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to jump around here. So Apollo, the Apollo suit is pot for NASA spec. Yeah, so they run right around four and a half, I'm sorry, three and a half PSI for an average lunar suit, 3.7 PSI to be exact. And then they use um, five for kind of a testing purposes, a little more up to, you know, eight for mine, around a 10. Apollo likes to go around six and they test it there. So I'm going to plan that plastic check. Get a question? Oh, for ambient. Yeah. So, Where's getting started? I know from the MDS crew, they keep on iterating. The same thing is here true. I've been iterating now for a good half of, I think, two months alone on this, actually. Here's one of my attempts at an arm war. I 3D printed a mold for it, used my leg to spin coat silicone and also some material into it and create my own pleat. This right here burst at 30 PSI. $10 of materials for an arm gore, for a joint. So goals, no pressure. Get it fully vac tight. Right now at full three and a half PSI, this thing consumes like four CFM. That tank should last three hours metabolically. It lasts around 45 minutes to be exact because I got leak problems. A lower pressure is not so, not so it's not such a big deal, but get it, see, get it sealed tight. Now a friend of mine, I can't mention his name, has mentioned it's a good chance I, I can go to NASTAR and I test it in an altitude chamber to 80K feet. And that's my next goal is to get that prepared and just sit in there for three hours and just chill and run it through. Um, next please. So he doesn't notice yet. My end goal is, is go to his hab and then ruin this suit. Not necessarily intentionally, but I want to spend a week there if possible or two. And when they use their suits, I'll learn mine. If mine fails, I'm a casualty. And I want to know, can I mingle the best established and see how this holds up? Much of the power, though, is easily usable. I mean, the neck rings, for example. These are for a pressure cooker. 30 PSI rated, right? Plenty of pressure range for a neck ring. Like 30 bucks from Goodwill. That's it. It's that simple. So they're all metal parts you can reuse. The bladder itself, you throw away. But everything else, clean it off, reuse it. It's metal. So I didn't do this whole method instead. Uh, and I will mention the next slide, please. The hardest part of this suit wasn't really building it. It was finding suppliers who wouldn't get in my way, to be honest. The oxygen was the hardest part, by the way. That was a nightmare because 
They freak out if you want to get oxygen any other, other, other than welding. Well, for good reason, I guess, but still. These folks were all pivotal and helped me kind of bring these together and, and make it all possible. Um, and really, this is all Q&A. I want to hear from you all because you're, I really have a college degree. You're all the geniuses out here, seriously. So pass it around. Good question. Yeah. Nice. This is a, a great step forward. What are you doing for environmental control and temperature regulation inside the suit? Ah, so Colony Cooler makes a thing called, you can buy his backpack and the undersuit for $400. That is has the same plugs that NASA uses, the little tiny CVC plugs. So this is literally a black Spanx onesie has tubes in it. And then a pump and a backpack here for this mode. Normally it goes to that silver box down there, which is the on backpack cooler that has its own plugs. So I can transfer from, you know, temporary cooler or a handheld cooler to the backpack one. It's the thing the auction too. Oh, and more accurately, if I was building a vacuum pipe suit for actual Mars, I use a sub sublimation device. That's why it is because you can't use sublimation on, on, on Earth for right now. That's, that's a temporary standing right now. Have you considered using a smartwatch in exercise mode to do the blood oxygen level, uh, fitness, heart rate, all those things? You know, Absolutely. The next thing is to add sensors. I'm a ham operator. I've already put APRS on my on my transmitter. I'm also going to be adding biomedical stuff, IV or ISCRD C, like sensors, that kind of stuff. And that's all next gen. Absolutely. And biomed too. All right, CO2 the works. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> all right, Peter. So if we're understanding this correctly, not only have you created a spacesuit, you've also made a backpack and a comm system, and you've made it completely movable and almost completely airtight. You can also hold more pressure than a spacesuit built by NASA. You've done all of this using off the shelf components. Yeah. And instead of having hundreds of people to help build that suit, you've done it all on your own in your garage. Yeah. You've taken the price of a suit from at least hundreds of thousands, but if you include the backpack systems and everything else, millions, Twenty million, at least essentially yeah. doing this, it's not complete, but it's, it's very good. And you're doing it for under $10,000, right? Is that you with me so far? Exactly. If you know history of suits, I'm at Gemini in actual kind of mobility range um, with the functionality of Apollo for the rebreathing section. So that's kind of your tech level right now is that kind of arrow stuff. So first of all, I want to give you a round of applause because that's absolutely bloody amazing. <laughs> Secondly, the big question, right? If somebody took this into space right now, what would happen to it? And what would you need to do to make it actually compatible for space travel? Uh, add some insulation right now. It's just two pieces, just two layers, the outer cover plus the inner bladder. I need to add some mylar to add the buffer. But everyone knows that. It's trivial stuff. You just sew it together. Done. Uh, Waste of time to even build for Earth, honestly. Fix the leaks. That's it. Fix the leaks and pressurize it again. Do it. Thermally, I'm not sure I can handle minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit and all that kind of stuff where things don't creep and crack and O-rings go bad. But for the temperature ranges we have here on Earth, the parts don't expand or contract too much. I'm not a mechanical engineer on the slides. I'm an EET who dabbles in 3D printing and a lot of machining on his free time. So. Yeah, this is a pretty impressive. How, how much does it change when you've got it set at 15 PSI above ambient pressure as far as the uh, balloon effect of the suit and it's flexible not that bad at all surprisingly i you know i thought the hard parts of the knees i'm not i need joints at all in the slightest i just haven't bothered yet i don't need to honestly but for the arm part i mean i can move around the range of motion doesn't decrease at all it becomes harder but there's no like locking problems at all in the slightest and honestly between one and three psi is you can tell it's there but it's kind of marginal gains honestly once you're once you get up to pressure it's just kind of the same thing So Peter, when we were talking on the Seattle Zoom session, we talked about uh, you heating and cooling your extremities in space. You still need a full heating, cooling suit to do that. Um, and James, you have video of him donning this on those sessions, so you can pull those out, but uh, before you step outside, you still need to address that. 
one, your extremities are just going to get too cold without that. To an extent, I'm making the assumption of I'm on, on, on the EVAs on the dark side of the moon. It's just hot. You're battling heat, not cold. So cooling is easy to do. Heating is also electrical, electrical elements, honestly. So that's, those are all things that are easy to addable if necessary for an actual mission, but are kind of assumed at this point in time. The cooling part's done. That works very well, just ice water. But heating, not yet. And Peter, from what I understand, you've also developed a VR haptic that does cooling. Well, the same understood I bought, and Jeff is part of this too. This is, this is a whole like Kevin Bingham thing happening here. So I helped develop a smell vision device called Cilia for Haptic Solutions for CES earlier this year. I was smell in VR. And so that can output motor control bolsters, right? To change fans and blow up some smells. I wired that into this exact controller right here. And now I can be in, be in VR. If I collide to a boundary that has cold in VR, it makes me cold. And it's, it's really crazy. So the suit has other things you can do with it too, as far as like the parts you use. Um, you know, the one thing I've noticed with this whole thing is that the complexity is there. The most of it really is just honestly, detail work and uh, just, just detailed work. You gotta show your work is detailed, but it's not that hard to build. It really isn't. Thank yeah. you so much, Peter. This talk was certainly a first for our convention. Thank you so much. And I do want to say, I have enough balls of auction to two more runs. You want to see it, see it later on in our day. I can handle that. So even scrub too. I brought some scrub material too. I want to try it out. Yeah. Right. So I'm kind of tired. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's pretty cool. I love that. So this concludes our afternoon session. Uh, the next program will be in 45 minutes here in the Arizona Ballroom. It'll be our public panel of the search for life on Mars with heavy lifts. So don't miss it. We'll see you in 45 minutes. Okay.